The trip back was a long and occasionally eventful one. But it was only in trying to look back on it afterwards that things became strange. Clemente's wing had mended beautifully, but at our insistence, he made regular stops to rest. Though a remedy fared both better and worse. Her foreleg was encased in a thick, rigid cast to prevent her from walking. She was extremely weak and in dire need of rest and recovery. Velvet, go to sleep, Zenith intoned, carefully using our unicorn companion's name. Breath of Phoenix takes time to do its work. Goddesses, Velvet, I chimed in. You're worse than... well, all of us when you give us medical pony and orders. Velvet Remedy ignored us, instead cooing at Pyrelite and nuzzling her softly. Hear that, Pyrelite darling? Xena's little brew has made me part Phoenix. Isn't that wonderful? It is just a name, Xena sighed. Velvet Remedy continued to play with Pyrelite, who fluttered about my beautiful friend with unconcealed joy at her survival. The Balefire Phoenix kept perching on Velvet's cast, which I couldn't imagine was really helping. I itched, and I didn't really like that. I swore to myself that the very first thing I would do upon returning to Temponi Tower was find homage and promise whatever I had to in order to get in that taint purge spell cast. The taint purging spell cast on me. I feared it might already be too late. Well, second thing. First, we would need to set up my friend in, friend in a luxury suite where Velvet could get some damn rest. If you don't go to bed right when we get to Ten Pony, I swear I'm going to tie you to the bed. Velvety's eyes widened, then narrowed, as she gave me a sultry look. Oh, little Pip, you tease. But really, that's your kink, not mine. I sputtered. It was almost... It was most definitely not my kink. Thankfully, Velvet Remedy had turned her spotlight on Zenith. Yesterday, when that siren went off, were you hearing it just in your ears? Velvet Remedy asked. Zebra gave her an odd look. I don't blame her. Finding the question equally strange until I heard Zenith's answer. How else could I be hearing that dreadful noise? She seemed to consider. I have felt sounds before, low vibrating mumble, rumbles, but this was no such sound. Velvet Remedy nodded and looked to the rest of us. It took me a moment, but then the realization hit me. It see, I, it seemed so obvious that I was looking down the scope of Little Macintosh as the zombie pony came into view. A slight squeeze of the trigger, and Little Macintosh roared, the creature's head exploding. I turned, checking for any more of the flesh-eating zombies, but my EFS compass was clean of red. I floated my weapon away, feeling a pang. It was tragic and terrible that these zombies were once living ponies who had become trapped, imprisoned in decaying bodies and minds, slowly tortured by the rotting insanity that turned them into mindless monsters bent on devouring other ponies. Yet part of me remembered, all too horrifically, that these were even worse fates. I turned back to eating my soup. The others were settling down to dinner as well. Twilight was fading. The ruins of the old power substation loomed above us. We had chosen it because the crumbling walls would shield the light of our cooking fire. Clemente wanted to push the rest of the way to Manhattan, but yielded to our persuasions. Velvet stirred, or not Velvet, Zenith stirred the pot again, offering Velvet another helping. Pyrolite had flown off hunting the moments the sky band had touched down, and Velvet had been anxious about her ever since the first zombie pony appeared. I heard hoof steps and a clattering sound approach, followed by a heavy, ragged breathing that didn't sound like any pony. Waving to the others, I floated the zebra rifle and brought up my EFS again, scanning the area for hostile life. No red, but there were several approaching non hostile entities. I breathed a sigh of relief. Several minutes later, the traveling merchant moved into the light of our campfire. Upon seeing us, she froze, eyes darting to my very heavily armored 
I still realized. Party. The two-headed cattle, carrying her wares, moved plaintively behind her. Clemity flew over, causing the merchant to take a step back. But he was all smiles, and a hearty hoofshake. Howdy there. Been ages since I've seen any sort of caravan. I'd be much obliged if y'all would join us for soup. I promise, it's mighty tasty. He leaned towards her and whispered loudly. I didn't cook it. The merchant smiled, the tension in her body melting away. Thank you kindly. She hitched her cattle to the trash bin and trotted over to join us. I gasped as the large beast pushed past the, as a large beast pushed past the cattle and lumbered in after her, slowly uh, growling softly. What? What is th th that? Velvet Remedy stammered, eyes wide. The merchant laughed. Oh, don't you mind cuddles? He really is a friendly bear, unless you all are raiders. The pony smiled. A lady can't be wandering in the wastelands without a friend, you know. There's some bad folk out here. Yao Guai, Arzeba whispered strangely to Velvet. I've never met such a beast before, Velvet Remedy said, still wide-eyed. Well, truth be told, I never met either a pegasus nor a zebra before, the merchant replied good-naturedly as Enoth offered her a bowl of soup. Thank you, miss. What brings you out this way? Clemity asked curiously. Doing the new run between Shattered Hoof and Manhattan, the merchant pony said with a smile. Figure I ought to give in the new action before every pony else does. Suddenly, Clement took the air, darting back to where the Sky Bandit had parked. We all watched as he returned with his saddlebags and started pulling out seemingly random junk. Everything from old boxes of instant mashed potatoes to small caliber firearms that were, quite frankly, beneath us. Wait, when exactly did any lethal ranged weapon become beneath us? Where did you get those? Velvet Remedy asked. When did you find them? I thought we had sold everything non-essential at Ten Pony Tower. Scavenging old Olne, Clemmer replied. He started to pick up the best things to barter with, while Velvet Remedy just shook her head. She got up and hobbled over, nudging him aside to rearrange his selection. I will now tell you a secret, said Zenith, as she leaned close to the Pegasus. It is possible, and permissible, to pass by a filing cabinet, or garbage barrel, without looking inside. I face hoof as Calamity turned to her with a wide, mocking, amazed eyes. Really? How? I ain't learned that trick. Obviously. I found myself smiling at that. A thought struck me. Hey, Calamity, can we take a swing by Shattered Hoof on our way? I want to tell... God. I frowned as Velvet Remedy once again submerged herself in the original Fluttershy orb. I knew now that Steel Hooves hadn't quite been right about the Yellow Pegasus, but he'd still been close enough for me to worry about my friend, especially with the strain, physically and mentally, that this week had put Velvet Remedy under. She'd come chillingly close to dying, twice. And even if there was no visible scars or lasting physical damage from the loss of her leg, the psychological impact would not heal with magical ease. Her alteration under Zenith's brew showed no outward signs, but I could not imagine that it was not weighing on her as well. All this on top of the horrors of Stable 2 Massacre. I looked away, tracing my right forehoof over the metal floor of the Sky Bandit. We were nearing Shattered Hoof. I could see the lights in the darkness. I pushed my thoughts in other directions, purposefully distracting myself. I thought of the orbs I had seen yesterday. For the life of me, I couldn't imagine how, or why, the Leaf Fall Lane spa memory had ended up locked in that cabinet. Most of the time, the location of memory orbs I found struck me as completely logical. This one did not. The other orb did, although it took me a while to puzzle it out. The steel rangers had likely been trying to make their way to the hospital roof, led by the robed unicorn mare in their party. With the information in that orb, they could have gotten a fix on the location of the central hub of this single Pegasus project, 
whatever that happened to be. As for Rarity's reason to make a recording of the memory, I trust to believe that at that moment, Rainbow Dash had asked her to design the Enclave armor, and she was happy a moment for her. She was, at heart, a dressmaker, and finally her job and her beloved hobby had united after a fashion. No pun intended. I could imagine the graceful, elderly unicorn wanting to relive that moment again and again, especially as things began to fall apart for her friends. Not unlike Velvet Remedy. Okay, little pale, Clement called out. We're heading in. The Pegasus was in a good mood. He was flying again. Velvet seemed to be okay. And he'd gotten to chat with a caravan merchant and barter. Or more precisely, watch a Velvet Remedy barter. I've been surprised at how little items, how many little items he had managed to scavenge from Olulne, while the rest of us were focused on just moving through. I wasn't the only one with a vice. Incoming Griffins, Clamity called out. I brought out my EFS to verify that they were friendly. A moment later, Blackwing and her talons flew into view, circling and pulling up alongside of us. Lil Pip and friends, she said. I felt my cheeks redden. Why was it never Calamity and Friends, or Velvet Remedy and Friends? I wondered for what seemed like the millionth billionth time. Of course, by now, I knew the answer. I had homage, and my companions to thank for it. Yay. Blackwing, I said, brushing off my embarrassment to talk to the Griffin. I was hoping to see you. I have something I need to ask you for. I was hoping if we could come to an arrangement. Oh? The Griffin Merc raised an eyebrow. This should be good. I woke up, finding myself staring at the familiar ceiling of Dr. Helping Hoof's clinic. Only this time, I wasn't bound. I knew better than to get up too fast. Instead, I cleared my throat loudly. The voices beyond the partition stopped, and a shadow approached. Dr. Helping Hoof pushed aside the partition and led me curiously. When I said that I could make a tidy profit off you, I did not mean that as an encouragement. Velvet Remedy pushed past him, wobbling as she tried to walk on just three legs. Her eyes were narrowed, and her voice was cross. I was completely expecting this. I can't believe it, she nearly shouted. After everything we've been through, you use them again? I had to, I said evenly. It was the only way. The only way to make sure Red Eye listened. But it was only a one time thing, and I sought treatment immediately. I leveled a gaze at her. On my own, I could point out. One time? Of course. Until the next time you decide you need them, though it seethed. Little Pip, haven't you learned anything? You can't do just one time. I winced. She was right. I was playing with fire, even though I knew <clears throat> I was soaking in whiskey. Please. I know this is bad, but it was really important. <coughs> I know this will make it harder for me, so I'm going to need you to... Let me see, she demanded. And Dr. Helping Hoof had politely backed away. See? Your goddess damned inventory sorter, little pip. Velvet Emdy barked. I want to see for myself that you didn't keep any. A shot of fear went through me. I looked at my pip back for her to see praying that I'd actually tossed the damn party time mintals into a burning trash barrel the moment I trotted out of the encampment. I prayed that my addiction to the little pony in my head hadn't somehow played tricks with my memory. I was going to be doing too much of that on my own. Okay, fine, Velvet said. I should look through my inventory, and thankfully, I found no sign of PTMs. And you believe, and you better believe, I'll be going through your things back in the room and quite regularly, from now on. I nodded. Thank you, Velvet. I... You've proven that you can't be trusted, she snapped, her words wounding me, even more so because I deserved it. Dr. Helping Hoof's assistant trotted forward, smiling indulgently. Velvet Remedy looked to the white unicorn buck with the candy red and striped white mane. Will it hurt? Velvet asked, sounding worried. Shooting me a dark look, she added, Now that she doesn't deserve a little.
of it. Turning back to the white unicorn, Velvet admitted, She'd been through so much, I don't want her to have to suffer anymore. Don't worry, the unicorn said. She won't remember any pain. Turning to me, she asked, Are you ready to do this? I nodded. Let's get it over with. I slowly pulled myself out of bed and followed him. As he walked away, I heard Velvet Remedy moan. You're going to destroy yourself trying to save the entire wasteland, little pip. A piercing white light above me died. I found myself in darkness, staring up at an unfamiliar ceiling inlaid with strangely patterned mirrors. I was laying back in a chair, a bizarre and uncomfortable position, and I had obviously no idea how I'd gotten there. The last thing I remember was being in Dr. Helpingham's clinic. I seemed to recall that I had been treated for PTM use, and voluntarily at that. I cringed, my mind filling with shame as I remember talking or taking the tin from the nurse's station. I was humiliated and disgusted with myself for the weakness I gave into every time I could have thrown it away. For the life of me, I couldn't remember actually taking one. Or for that matter, I didn't remember volunteering for treatment. Although, I could remember acting as if I had once it was over. A deep, alien terror started to envelop me as I tried to retrace my actions, only to find my memories of even the flight back to the piecemeal at best. Ever since leaving Maripony, my sense of time had become Swiss cheese, but the scattered moments I did remember didn't leave me with the impression that I'd been losing time. A familiar white unicorn buck appeared, leaning over me, his scarlet and candy red mane draped down so it almost touched my face. His rim reminded me of Pinkie Pie's at the party, after it had seemed to deflate. Don't panic. Where am I? How did I get here? Who are you? The questions tumbled out of me as fast as I could form them. The unicorn raised a silencing hoof, but I didn't want to be silenced. What happened to me? I felt the touch of another hoof on my shoulder as Homage stepped from the chair. Relax, love. My eyes darted between them, my emotions in turmoil. Little Pip? Homage asked. Do you trust me? The answer shot through all my dismay and confusion. Yes. Homage whispered. Then still your thoughts, love. Relax. She helped guide me off the chair into her embrace. I pressed myself against her, breathing hard, trying to find a way to, to piece in the storm of panic that threatened to overwhelm me. Her scent became a life preserver, tossed into my ocean of distress, and a rope with which to pull myself to safety. Slowly, I relaxed. Little Pip, this is Life Bloom, Homage said finally introducing me to the, formally to the white unicorn with the red and scarlet mane and tail. I'm pleased to meet you again, Life Bloom said. Velvet Remedy and Homage have told me so much about you. I nodded slowly, uh, piecing a little together. You are Dr. Helping Hoof's assistant, right? The one that Velvet Remedy has been buying spells from? Indeed I am. Homage stroked my mane gently, as if she could brush out the little shakes I was feeling. You remember what I told you about the ponies who really run Ten Pony Tower? Life Bloom is one of them. The unicorn buck bowed with a smile. And you are the stable dweller whom DJ Pwn3 and Homage have woven into the bringer of life. I flushed with embarrassment, looking away. And humble, the buck said with a smile. That's a good sign. Turning back to him, I asked again, this time more slowly. Where am I? What happened to me? The unicorn's horn glowed a bright crimson. A small box floated into view. I recognized the kind of box. It was the kind which held memory orbs. These, little Pip, are yours. Mine? I took a deep breath of gasp, uh, trying to grasp what he said. They're my memories? Of the last couple days, Homage said in agreement. I reeled. I'd lost days? What? Well, why'd you remove them? Because you asked me to, Lefbloom said. 
and because Hamish persuaded me, it was for a good cause. Life Bloom is a bit of a medical protege. Takes to new spells like no pony I've ever seen. He's the only unicorn in Tempony Tower to have mastered the old memory spells once used by the Ministry of Morale, Hamish informed me. He's also the one who can cast the Taint Purge. Looking at me knowingly, Hamish followed up with a little revelation. So, how are you feeling? I stopped, assessing myself. I felt tired. Strange. Strained. The burns on my flank and side had been healed, but they were still tender. The deep, unsettling itch was gone. There may be minor mutations, Life Bloom announced, but nothing life threatening, or even, I suspect, life changing. I'm pretty certain we purged you in time. I felt my knees give out a sudden rush of gratefulness, weakened me. Oh, thank you. The box of memory orbs came with a note in my own tooth writing. Little Pip, these memory orbs inside the box are in order. The first is pretty much a table of contents, and the others are most of my slash your memories from the last few days. The three important ones I think you will want to relive are orbs four, six, and eight. Everything else is just long, dull fights, and routine stuff. I don't think you'll really need to spend hours trapped in a memory orb just so we can relieve our bowel moments or hours of feeling itchy. You watch any of these, I mean, don't watch any of these until after I get to black, get the black book and take it to Maripony. Please. I know that's going to be really hard for you slash me, but it's important. Yours yourself, Lee, little Pip. I read it again and again, but it still made no sense. I looked at the orbs. I wanted my memories back. I wanted to know what I did over the last few days. I needed to know why I had taken part of that mentals again. Why I couldn't possibly... What could have possibly been so dire as to make me do that? A bluish sheath of magic closed the lid, removing the memory orbs from my sight, and floated the box out of my hooves. Homage magically lifted it, placing it into her safe and locking it. The huge painting of Splendid Hoof Valley floating back into its place. She turned towards me, smiling. Now, how soon do you have to go? I shook my head, completely at a loss. I felt untethered, adrift. I didn't know what my plans were, what I was supposed to be doing next. All I did know was that Velvet Remedy needed time to recuperate. In reality, so did Calamity. Maybe all of us did. I hated the idea of spending another day on myself, when there were ponies in the Equestrian Wasteland suffering and dying because I wasn't there to help them. But this wasn't time spent for me, it was for my friends, and I couldn't do anything without them. I needed them, now more than ever. I think we can take a day or two, I said hesitantly, but no more than that. Homage smiled. Perfect. I'll start dinner. I remembered something. Thirty-one! How could you do that to me? Because I know your body like the beautiful instrument it is, she called back as she made her way into the kitchen, and I can coax the most beautiful music from it. I felt myself go weak. Not what I meant. I looked around, wondering suddenly where Zenith was. Hello, me. Welcome to my memories. I was looking at myself in a full-length mirror. I could see life bloom and homage moving around in the background. The room was dark and strangely shaped with an odd chair in the center beneath a shining spotlight. Mirrored inlays on the ceiling caught the light and bounced back off the chair, making the lines of mirror seem to glisten. This was just a table of contents, I told myself. It's okay to watch just this one. I felt utterly confused and they needed at least a little context. If you are not me, then these memories are not for you, I held myself say, with what was actually my own mouth. This was supremely weird. I was riding me. Please, do not watch any more of them, and return them immediately to DJ Pwn3 or his assistant at Ten Pony Tower. The deep itching was gone. 
I had stood in front of the mirror, saying these things, after Life Bloom had used the Taint Purge spell on me. Now, assuming I am me, and this is supremely weird, and I thought writing the note felt bizarre, I paused, apparently regathering my train of thought. Do I usually ramble like this? Okay, first, the big thing you need to know. I stopped again, feeling my body deflate with a sigh. Damn it, little Pip, I said, stomping. I'm watching this before. I told me to, aren't I? I felt a rush of embarrassment as I realized I had caught me. Celestia raped you with the burning sun if you can't even take simple instruction from myself. Do I have no fucking self-control? I felt myself stomp again, feeling myself huffing. The entire memory was too surreal. Damn it. Okay, sorry for that if I'm watching this when I should be. If so, I owe myself an apology. Taking a deep breath, I started again. I'm going to make this short, just in case I'm the kind of idiot I'm afraid I am. I gave myself a dark look, then continued. First, by now you've already figured out that there are two kinds of memory spells. The first records a memory, like the spell enchanted into a recollector. The second extracts a memory completely, and that's the kind the Ministry of Morale used when they weren't being gentle. I felt myself frowning, and the little pip in the mirror frowned back. Second, I've got a plan for dealing with the goddess. I've told every pony their parts, and just their parts. I'm the only pony who knew all of it. Unfortunately, we can't do anything about the goddess if we can't reach Mariponi. And if I, I go in there knowing the plan, Trigza can read it right out of my head. Game over. So, I felt myself lift a foreleg and make a sweeping motion as the little pip in the mirror did exactly the same. Crap. I knew I was right. Other me, that is. Ah. So, for the love of Celestia and Luna, for the love of homage, don't watch any more of the damn memory orbs until after you take the black book to Mariponi. I stomped with a huff. Seriously, I am so disappointed in me. Then sheepishly, I added, that is, assuming I should be, if I really held out like I told me to. I really have an egg on my face right now, don't I? I felt utterly guilty, and pissed at myself. Now, the fourth memory orb is my conversation with Blackwing. I'm sure I'll need to know the detail. Need, no, to need, need to know the deal we struck. The sixth one, I'll need for an entirely different reason. That's the one where you took a part-time mental. I'm beginning to question if that was the right call. But I really, really need needed to be at my most persuasive, you see. The eighth memory was of being greeted by homage as we returned to Tempony Tower, and the one that I know you want her to live again and again. I gave myself a wink. Footnote. Maximum level. Quest perk added. Touched by taint. 1. Exposure to taint has altered your physiology. When under the effects of advanced radiation poisoning, 400 plus rads, any crippling limbs will automatically regenerate.